Blood clots are making a lot of headlines right now, and I won't go into the details about that in this video, but let's talk about what blood clots are and why they're so dangerous right now. The medical term for a blood clot is a thrombosis. When we talk about a blood clot, we're almost always referring to a blood clot that initially forms in a vein, not an artery. And then that blood clot breaks off, travels in the bloodstream, and then lodges into another location. And when it does that, it's called an embolism. So everything I just described taken as a whole is called a venous thromboembolism, or a VTE for short. Over the past few years, even before COVID, the burden of VTE disease has been increasing. In fact, now the incidence for a first episode of venous thromboembolism in the population is about one to two per 1,000 person years. VTE most commonly starts out as a blood clot in the leg, and then it breaks off and travels to the lungs. There are literally thousands of reasons why someone can get a blood clot. But whatever the cause, it's almost always related to three specific processes known as a Virchow's triad. One, reduced blood flow as occurs when someone is immobile for a long period of time. Two, disturbances or injury to the wall of the blood vessels. For example, the wall of the vein or the wall of the artery. And even when you have atrial fibrillation, when there's no movement of the atria, that blood becomes stagnant there, and I'll get into that later. And then the third thing is changes in blood components that make the blood more prone to clotting. For example, some people have what's known as the prothrombin gene mutation. But the reality is, is that VTE, it usually develops as a result of the synergistic effect of multiple risk factors. For example, let's say someone is genetically predisposed to having blood clots, like they might have the prothrombin gene mutation. And if that person becomes immobilized for a long period of time, like if they're on a long road trip or if they're on a long plane ride, or maybe they have surgery where they're not, where they're not able to get out of bed for a long time, well, that person is much more likely to develop a blood clot when you start adding on all those risk factors. Then there's tons of genetic mutations that can make someone more prone to blood clots. There's factor V lidocaine mutation, there's antithrombin deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, in addition to that prothrombin gene mutation. Then there's other circumstances that increase that risk. Now I mentioned surgery already, but also things like physical trauma, being immobile for other reasons, certain medications, especially hormonal medications like oral contraceptive pills, and a bunch of medical conditions like cancer, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and yes, certain infections, including COVID. So why are blood clots so dangerous? Some blood clots go unnoticed and end up being completely harmless. Some blood clots go unnoticed, but then break off, travel to the lungs, and cause death within minutes. These are extreme ends of the spectrum, and then there's everything in between, which is what most people experience when they get a blood clot. When someone gets a blood clot in the deep veins of the leg, aka a deep vein thrombosis, or DVT, most people will have symptoms that leg will most likely become swollen they'll have more of a pink or reddish appearance and be somewhat painful that clot can almost always be seen with an ultrasound of the leg but symptoms or no symptoms that clot can break off travel via the largest vein in the body the ivc the inferior vena cava and then it makes its way to the right atrium of the heart then to the right ventricle of the heart, then to the pulmonary artery, and eventually becomes lodged in the smaller branches of the pulmonary arteries inside the lungs. And this is problematic for a few different reasons. For one, that means that part of the lung is not getting blood flow, which not only makes it harder for the lungs to get oxygen into the bloodstream, but it can also cause part of the affected lung tissue to die off. That's when it's called a pulmonary infarction. And sometimes that blood clot is so big it ends up blocking so much blood flow that the heart can barely pump blood forward. Sometimes this is so extreme that it causes someone to go into cardiac arrest. And things get really bad when you combine all of these processes together. So with the lungs not getting enough oxygen to the blood, that means that the heart is getting less oxygen and the heart is having a harder time pumping blood forward. And when you combine all these things together, it, it accumulates pretty quickly and things start escalating out of control to the point where you end up with potentially catastrophic consequences. This is why blood clots should never be taken lightly. Blood clots can also first develop in the arms, but this is usually a result of someone having an IV catheter in one of the big veins in the neck or the upper arm region, 
or if someone has a cancer in that region. And sometimes they form in the veins of the brain, something like central venous thrombosis. It's an uncommon but very serious disorder with symptoms ranging from headache, confusion, visual loss, seizures, all the way to coma. Why do people get central venous thrombosis? Well, many cases have been linked to genetic conditions that make people more prone to clotting, but it can also be related to infections and cancer. Blood clots can sometimes affect arteries as well. Rarely, blood clots can actually first form in an artery, especially in conditions like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. More commonly though, blood clots can be found in arteries as a result of one of two scenarios. One is what happens when people have atrial fibrillation. Now in this condition, the blood in the atria of the heart, especially in that left atrium, it becomes stagnant as a result of loss of the atrial pumping that occurs in this condition. Basically, when atrial fibrillation is going on, the atria are essentially just quivering and they're not actually pumping. So when that blood becomes stagnant, the likelihood of clot formation there is exponentially increased. And then that blood clot travels to the left ventricle of the heart. And from there, it can go to pretty much any artery of the body. It can go to the arteries of the brain and cause a stroke. It can travel to the arteries of the gut and cause mesenteric ischemia. It can travel to the arteries of the leg and cause a blockage of blood flow to that limb. Now, another way a clot can end up in an artery is when there's literally a hole in the heart, something known as an atrial septal defect, which is more common than people realize. Now, there's different types of atrial septal defects, but basically it's a hole that exists in the wall that separates the right and left atrium. So let's say someone develops a DVT of the leg and that blood clot then breaks off, it travels to the vena cava and subsequently makes its way to the right atrium of the heart. Well, it can then go through that atrial septal defect and now it's in the left atrium. From there, it can go to the left ventricle and then to the aorta and then to any arterial branch of that aorta, including arteries of the brain where it can cause a stroke. There's different arteries that serve the brain and depending on which arteries those blood clots end up lodging in, it will affect said area of the brain and so the ensuing neurological defects will depend on not only the size of the stroke, but also the location of the brain that is affected.